In Galatians chapter 6, verse 10, God's people are referred to as the household of faith, or as another translation puts it, the family of believers. One of the most remarkable characteristics about believers is this wonderful treasure we have called faith that binds us in an unbreakable way to the heart of the Heavenly Father and to each other. And today on this episode of Discover Your Spiritual Identity, we're going to celebrate what it is to be people of faith, what faith is all about and what it affects in our lives. Let's define the term first. Number one, it can mean the sum of all the principles that we believe in as believers in the Bible. Because, uh, for instance, in Jude chapter 1, it says to earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. And that's talking about the pure doctrine that was laid as a foundation of the church in the very beginning. But faith can also be this ability to trust God, this ability to adhere to the promises of God, no matter what happens in your life. And for that particular uh, scriptural definition, I'd like to go to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. I love it. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. My favorite version of that particular verse is the amplified version. Listen to it closely. Now, faith is the assurance, the confirmation, the title deed of the things we hope for, being the proof of things we do not see and the conviction of their reality, faith perceiving as real fact what is not revealed to the senses. That is so rich. I need to read it again. The Amplified Version of Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now, faith is the assurance, the confirmation, the title deed of the things we hope for, being the proof of things we do not see and the conviction of their reality, faith perceiving as real fact. Let me say that again. Faith perceiving as real fact what is not revealed to the senses. See, you and I are not bound to the five senses. That's a prison to those who are unregenerated. But once you move into faith, you move beyond what you can see and hear and smell and taste and touch into the kingdom of God that functions by faith. And the kingdom of God is permeated with the nature of the king, which includes his attribute of faith. He is the faithful God. That means he's full of faith. He's full of faith toward us. If he's faithful to us, then he believes in us. He believes in our potential. He believes in our purpose. He believes in our value to him. And so the kingdom of God is saturated with this characteristic. And if we're going to function in the kingdom, we must be people who maintain a faith mindset. Easier said than done. I want to celebrate right here at the beginning that faith is a gift. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 says, By grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. And the word it refers back to faith. By grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. That's the amazing thing about God, that he gives you the ability to believe, and then he blesses you because you believe. But it was all traceable back to him to start with. You want more proof? Try Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, that says Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. Looking unto Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross and despised the shame. And in that same verse, it said, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Now, one confidence building revelation that comes to me through that verse is that Jesus, who starts 
this awakening of faith in us is not going to stop until it comes to full fruition and completion. He is the author and the finisher. You should celebrate that today. You should confess that. This salvation journey begins with the word of faith confession. Read Romans chapter 10, verses 8 through 10. It says that, and I'll break it down uh, into more understandable statements, that we should not try to achieve salvation by ascending up or by descending. In other words, by becoming good enough or by degrading ourselves as negatively as we can. We don't earn salvation by either of those means. But then it goes on to say, the word is near us, even in our hearts and in our mouths. That is the word of faith, which we preach, that if we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, if we believe that God has raised him from the dead, and if we confess it with our lips, we shall be saved. And that's called the word of faith. The amazing thing about it is this, that if the word of faith declarations that Jesus rose from the dead, that he died on the cross, that he was born of a virgin. Faith declarations like that coming out of our mouths can shift us from being children of darkness to children of light, being completely lost to being in a covenant relationship with God. Then I wonder what the word of faith in our mouth can continue to effect as we learn how to speak words of faith and not words of doubt, not words of fear. I want to share with you what I think is just an amazing revelation, that you only find the word faith two times in the Old Testament. And one time it was a rebuke because they didn't have it, and the other time it was a prophecy of a new covenant people who would have it. Now that's not to deny that there are numerous instances of faith being exhibited in the Old Testament. What tremendous people of faith Abraham and Isaac and Jacob were and all the other patriarchs, Joseph and his sons and, and the people of Israel and, and how they conquered against insurmountable odds. And yet, at a certain point in Deuteronomy 32.20, they were rebuked by Moses as people who had no faith. He said they were children in whom is no faith. And that was actually God speaking. He said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end will be, for they are a perverse generation, children in whom is no faith. And so he was talking about those that complained and rebelled against Moses' leadership in the wilderness and how that generation that came out of Egypt never saw the promised land. What a tragedy, because they could not enter in because of unbelief, the Bible said. They came out of Egypt, but could not enter into their destiny because of unbelief. God forbid that that ever be said of us. Now, still, I see something amazing about God, that even though that particular group of Israelites were children in whom was no faith. Still, he continued to pour out manna every day, six days a week. He continued to cause a river of water to flow out of the rock to sustain them in the wilderness. He continued to preserve their clothing during a four-decade-long wilderness journey. And so even though they had no faith, God still continued to move for them in a very supernatural way providing for their needs. And I said that to say this, don't think that you will only be receiving from God when you're on top of the mountain and you're full of faith and full of confidence. Sometimes when you're walking in low places and you just can't muster faith, God is still going to be taking care of you. He's your heavenly father. That's not uh, to say that we should become acceptant of unbelief or acceptant of living in doubt. But it does mean that God is still going to move in our behalf. Now, the other time faith is found in the Old Testament is Habakkuk 2.4. And that's the statement, the celebrated statement 
that caused such a spiritual rebirth in Martin Luther. When, if you'll remember, he was struggling to try and feel accepted by God. He was a very guilt-ridden Catholic monk who never could feel righteous in the sight of heaven, no matter what self-denial he went through. And then he read, the just shall live by his faith. And he said, I felt myself to have been reborn and to have gone through open doors into paradise. He said, this passage of Paul became to me a gate to heaven. When he realized that to be just, which means to be recognized as righteous in the sight of heaven, what God's primary requirement was, was faith to believe in the cross, to believe in the substitutionary price that was paid there, to believe in the power of the resurrection, to believe in the power of the name of Jesus. And when we set our faith on those things, we become the righteousness of God in Christ. How liberating is that? See, righteousness comes in response to faith, and then we live it out in our lives as an act of worship. Well, that was primarily a prophetic statement to be fulfilled in the new covenant to come. And if you read it in context, that becomes very plain. This is a serious matter, too, because Romans 14, 23 says, Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And so I don't think we should allow ourselves the luxury, permit me to use that word, the luxury of wallowing in self-condemnation and depression and discouragement and being totally negative about life. We may think those are acceptable attitudes. We shun these more gross sins like drunkenness and adultery and things like that. But then sometimes we allow negativity to rule our minds and rule our words and rule our conversations. And yet, Romans 14, 23 says, whatever is not of faith is sin. You and I must recoil from fear-filled statements coming out of our mouth and doubt-filled statements coming out of our mouth. We have to monitor our speech continuously. I have to. I've been serving God 50 years, and I've still got to be careful about what I allow out of my mouth. Now, I do not believe my words control my life because that would rob God of his sovereignty. He's Lord of my life. But I do believe that my words, if they're negative, can contaminate the atmosphere of my life and cause me to live beneath my privileges as a child of God. So let's work on that. In fact, Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 and 13 says, Beware, brethren, beware lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. And so we need to recognize that unbelief is evil. It is sin. And there's only one option for us, and that's to live in faith. I love how in Acts chapter 14, verses 26 and 27, it talks about how when Paul and his associates were preaching throughout Europe, that God opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. Isn't that an interesting thought, that God opened the door of faith to the Gentiles? See, faith is an opportunity that doesn't come to everyone. But thankfully, we're living in an age where multiplied millions are being exposed to the possibility of believing, believing the gospel promises and their lives becoming completely transformed as a result. I am so thankful today that one day back in the fall of 1970, God opened the door of faith to me and I saw the light of heaven shining through and I came out of darkness into his marvelous light. Praise God. This is one of my favorite faith stories in the Bible concerning Peter. This was right at the end of Jesus' journey, and he's saying some final things to his disciples that are very important. 
And to Peter, he says this, Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. Isn't that amazing? He never told Peter that he would not fail. But he did tell Peter that his faith would not fail. Why didn't he pray that Peter would not fail? Because we have to face certain trials and tribulations and temptations and persecutions so that we can grow in faith as we respond to those. And if Jesus did everything for us, there would be no maturity taking place in us. It would be all an act of God. But he did allow Peter to know that he was with him in the process. And he was watching over him carefully. And he said, Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to have you. Why did he want Peter? Because Satan is smart enough to know where leadership ability is. And if you want to know who he attacks the most ferociously, it's those who have influence over others. Same uh, with S Simon Peter as it is with you. Same with you as it is with Simon Peter. If you have leadership ability, Satan may desire to have you, but you have a great intercessor. His name is Jesus Christ. He's the great high priest who ever lives to make intercession for us. Now, what happened? Of course, Peter denied that he knew the Lord. He said, I don't even know this man. He cursed, he railed while Jesus was being tried and then, of course, was sent to crucifixion. And he went out and wept bitterly. I believe that Peter came to the edge of suicide because he really he probably felt like he was the traitor. Remember uh, at the Last Supper when Jesus said, have not I chosen you 12 and one of you is a devil? Well, I believe all eyes turned to Peter because on their way to Jerusalem, Peter tried to talk Jesus out of suffering. He said, after Jesus declared, I'm going to Jerusalem to be offered up and crucified, he said, be it far from you, Lord, you can't do this. And Jesus turned around to Peter and said, get behind me, Satan, you're an offense to me. You savor not the things of God, but the things of man. And so I have this feeling that no other disciple had ever been referred to that way. Jesus had never called any of them Satan except Peter. So at the Last Supper, when he said, have not I chosen you 12 and one of you is a devil, I can almost imagine all eyes turning to Peter. And no wonder Peter so boisterously defended himself saying, Lord, if all men deny you, I'm not going to deny you. And then Jesus solidified it and said, before the cock crows, you're going to deny me thrice. So that put the nail in the coffin, so to speak. And Peter was convinced it was inevitable he was going to betray the Lord. I do believe that he came right up to the edge of suicide, where he felt like all hope was gone, that he had failed too miserably. But Jesus' prayer kept him from going off the edge. He said, I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. And listen to the rest. And when you are converted, strengthen your brethren. In other words, you're going to go through a really weak time where the enemy is going to sift you, which is actually good in the end result because sifting wheat only divides the chaff from the grain and the pure grain is left over. And so it really just knocks some chaff off of Peter. But listen, he said, I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. And when you are converted, in other words, when you turn around and get readjusted in your mindset, you're going to have strength to give away to others. And see, Peter was the first one to preach on Pentecost to people that were guilty of sending Jesus to his crucifixion. They were the, some of them, not all of them, certainly, but some of them were the ones who cried, crucify him. But because Peter had failed and denied the Lord, he felt compassion for those who had similarly failed and denied the Lord. And he brought in a harvest of thousands of souls. So he went through some things that knocked the pride out of him, knocked the self-assurance out of him, but it only served to position him in a place where his faith was even more powerful. 
The same is true for you. Let me say that again. The same is true for you. Now I'm going to talk about the glorious outcome of our faith. And that's found in uh, Ephesians in the fourth chapter, where it talks about how we will all eventually come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And so this faith journey is going to end in a spectacular way. At the graveside of Lazarus, Jesus said in John eleven twenty five, 25, I am the resurrection and the life. And he who believes on me, though he may die, he shall live. The faith that went with you into the altar when you gave your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ will go with you into the grave when you pass from this world. And that faith will bring you out in a resurrected, glorified, immortal form. And in Ephesians chapter 4, it says you will come forth to a perfect man. And that perfect man is the last Adam. It's the last Adam made up of the head, who is the Lord Jesus Christ, and the entire body of Christ that will all emerge in perfection, in the fullness of the stature of Christ, the full measure of of what a son of God is called to be, which is spectacular when you think about it. That's the end of our faith, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, Peter said. There's so much more that can be said about faith. I believe I'll do another episode on our calling to be the household of faith next week, and I'm going to cover the subject of increasing faith. It's one of the most amazing passages of Scripture in the New Testament where the disciples asked Jesus to increase their faith, and you will be surprised what he said in response. It will be shocking to you, I guarantee you. So let's grow in faith, children of God. Let's be people who believe no matter what comes our way in life.